Hi, welcome back to Grains and Small Places. And today we're going to be making a fall favorite. We're going to be making pumpkin cinnamon rolls and we're making it with fresh milk flour, of course. But first, I wanted to bring you in on something I'm really excited about. I've been working a long time on, lots of requests for this. Just a little sneak peek, it's not quite ready yet. But make sure that you're on my email list, you're subscribed to my YouTube channel or my Facebook page somehow so you know when this is ready to be released. So bear with me. I'm not an author. I'm not a professional editor. I did all the photographing, writing, editing, formatting, all those things myself. So hopefully you guys can bear with me a little bit with that one. I hope to offer this in paperback and hardback. So I'm working on the logistics. I plan to have this out hopefully by November 1st. So again, I will let you know as soon as I know when this is going to be ready for purchase. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the pumpkin cinnamon rolls. Let's get started. Okay, to get started, we're gonna be using my favorite bread flour combination, which is some kamut, a little bit, and hard white wheat. So we need a total of about 485 to 540 grams, which is like roughly four to four and a half cups. I'll make sure to put a link to this recipe in the description box below. It'll have your weights and your volumes for all of the ingredients. So I like to weigh out about 135 grams of kamut and 405 grams of hard white wheat. So the discrepancy is basically in the liquid in the pumpkin puree. So some pumpkin puree I find is much more liquidier than other pumpkin puree, which can be a little more dry. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out the amount of flour. You can always mill the small amount and then mill some more or just mill the full amount and then whatever you have left over, you can throw that in your fridge if you're gonna be using it within a week or your freezer or feed a sourdough starter if you've got that. But the pumpkin puree that I used today was a little bit on the more loose side. So I went ahead and did the complete 540 grams of wheat berries. So I like to measure by weight. I really find it gives me more accurate reading, but again, I do write my recipes both ways. So let's go ahead and head on over to the mill. I'm milling in my Nutri-Mill Harvest Grain Mill. I love this mill and I do have a coupon code that I can share with you that will save $20 off the purchase of your mill at Nutri-Mill or any of the Bosch mixers. The coupon code is grainy and I'll make sure to put a link to that in the description box below as well. And as you can see here, it makes nice fine flour. I also like to weigh out my pumpkin. We're gonna use about 250 grams of pumpkin. Now you can make and use homemade pumpkin puree or canned pumpkin puree, but whatever you decide to use, just make sure that it's one that doesn't have the seasonings in it because we're gonna go ahead and add those seasonings in later. Then I like to weigh out our milk. We're gonna add about four tablespoons of soft butter it's about 56 grams. I like to use unsalted butter, but if you're using salted butter, that's fine as well. Just decrease the amount of salt in the recipe. But this is unsalted butter. We're gonna heat up that milk and butter and make sure it's just before scalding. We don't want it to be bubbling or boiling, but we wanna heat that milk up because cold milk can inhibit gluten development. And we want that gluten for that nice stretchy dough. So we're gonna take this on over to my Anchorsome mixer. If you have a different mixer, that's fine as well. All the mixers mix just a little bit differently and have different kneading times. So just make sure you're checking the dough as you're going along, looking for that nice stretchy dough because I found that it can take anywhere from seven minutes to 30 minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and put in about 100 grams of brown sugar. If you prefer, you can always sub this out for honey or maple syrup. And then we're gonna use about a teaspoon of salt. And this is that Baja Gold Salt, which I also have a coupon code I'll link down in the description box below. This has my, been my favorite salt to bake with. And now we've switched over completely to using it for all of our baking and cooking, and it leaves no grittiness. I love that about this salt. And it also has the minerals, so it's more nutritious for us. Since this dough is gonna be a little bit of a sweeter dough, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a tablespoon of vanilla. We're also gonna add in two eggs. I like to kind of let my eggs come up to room temperature if you have eggs in your refrigerator. If you already have fresh chicken eggs that are at 
room temperature already, you're golden, good to go. You don't need to set them out. But I went ahead and set these out just a little bit before along with my butter, so that was nice and soft as well. Just gonna give my hands a little wash. Gonna scramble up these eggs, dump them on in the mixer. And if you saw a couple weeks ago, we did a pumpkin focaccia, which that was delicious. I went ahead and experimented by putting in the pumpkin spice and the cinnamon in with the dough and the dough was rose beautifully. I had no issues, so we're definitely going to be doing that today. So let's go ahead and put in our pumpkin puree. And then we're gonna use about two teaspoons of either pumpkin pie spice, or you can divide that out if you wanna do it individually and do like a teaspoon of cinnamon, a half a teaspoon of ginger, half a teaspoon of nutmeg, half a teaspoon of ground cloves. You can do it whichever way you prefer, or if you have some other pumpkin seasoning that you really enjoy and your family likes, go ahead and use that here. And we're gonna give that a nice little mix. And since our milk and butter was nice and warm and our eggs were room temperature, that should kind of like help bloom these spices and bring the flavor out. And let me tell you, this really this smelled amazing the entire time I was making it, just like the pumpkin cinnamon roll focaccia that we made. I'll try to link that video if you didn't catch that one. Okay, and in goes our freshly milled flour. We're gonna give that a mix. I never like to knead this quickly. You don't wanna ever put this on like a high speed, regardless of what kind of mixer you have, because that can just shred and tear the gluten as you're doing all that hard work and waiting all that time for that gluten to develop. But we're going to just make sure that all the flour is combined in with all the liquid ingredients, and we wanna make sure that there's no dry flour left because we're going to do what we call our autolyze next. And what that is, is it allows our fresh milled flour to start absorbing that water and it starts to allow the bran to soften. So sometimes people have struggle with fresh milled flour developing the gluten. And the main reason that is, is because that bran is still in the flour. But we want that bran because that gives us our fiber and some of the nutrition. So it's cutting through the fibers of the gluten. So what we wanna do is let that start softening. So generally I like to do at least 15 minutes. You can do this up to two hours if you want. If you wanna put it in the fridge, you can even do it overnight because we haven't put in the yeast yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover it. I'm gonna put my spoon on the top here, which reminds me that I haven't put the yeast in yet. Many of you have mentioned that you laughed because <laughs> you used to think that was a silly trick and then you found out that you forgot the yeast at one point in time. So thank you for sharing those awesome stories with me because I can tell you I do this because it's happened to me. <laughs> okay, now that it's been about 15 minutes, we can go ahead and put in our yeast and start the kneading process. I'm using instant yeast here. If you were using active dry yeast, you would need to bloom your yeast before you put it in at this point in time. So during that rest period, you could use a little bit of water, a little bit of sugar to bloom that yeast and it should get nice and foamy. If it's not nice and foamy, then there could be something wrong with your yeast. And this would be the point in time where you would put it in. If you're using the instant yeast, we're going to go ahead and put in about two and a quarter teaspoon of yeast. We're gonna go ahead and mix all that yeast in so that it's incorporated and it can start doing its magic. Then we can begin the kneading process. So as I was mentioning earlier, the kneading could take anywhere from seven minutes to 30 minutes. I will say if you have a Bosch type mixer, those generally need quicker because they're a little bit more aggressive with the kneading. So you generally can get your kneading done in less than eight minutes, I'd say on average. And then if you have a Anchorsome, I would say my average is somewhere between 10 and 18 minutes. Uh, sometimes we go to 20, 25 minutes, but generally between 10 and 18 minutes. And then KitchenAid's, generally take the longest. I know there's other mixers out there, but these are the most common I hear about. And those can take up to a half an hour. So generally what you need to do is knead it for a little bit, let it rest a little bit. Knead it for a little bit, let it rest a little bit. If you have the KitchenAid, cause you definitely don't want to destroy your, your mixer <laughs> or burn up the motor or anything like that. 
I usually need it at like the two o'clock position ish. So what you want to do anytime you're using a new mixer, anytime you're using new wheat berries, anytime you're making a new recipe, I always like to try to watch my dough. You want to continue to stop it and check it for stretchiness because it can over knead depending on the mix you have. Some of them are more likely to over knead than others, but you want just nice stretchy dough. I do mention the window pane in a lot of my recipes. Really all that is is just a way to explain to you how the when the gluten is perfectly developed. So when you can stretch the dough and it gets really thin, it's okay if it has a little tear. Just in general, you want the dough to be nice and stretchy. So I'm gonna go ahead now, the dough's nice and stretchy. I'm gonna cover this. We're gonna let it rise for one to two hours depending on the temperature in your household. So I generally will check it in about an hour with the instant yeast, it happens pretty quick. Active dry yeast sometimes takes a little bit longer. So while that's rising, we're gonna go ahead and work on the filling portion. I like to go ahead and melt eight tablespoons of butter. Again, this is unsalted butter. So if you're using salted butter, then you can take the pinch of salt out in the recipe, but I'm using unsalted because I like to add in my <laughs> favorite salt. Then we're going to go ahead and use a cup of brown sugar, about 200 grams, and two teaspoons of pumpkin pie spice. Or you can do, like I mentioned before, the, all of the individual spices. But also we're going to add an extra teaspoon of just the ground cinnamon. We're going to give that a nice little mix. Just going to set that to the side. Okay, now that our dough has risen double in size, it took about an hour, maybe a little bit over. I'm using my new stainless steel baking pan and I love this thing. I've been trying to switch over from non, not having non-stick pans anymore and as much as possible. I'm also trying to switch over to using some healthier like grass-fed, grass-finished butters and stuff like that. So I'm just, when I ever I make a recipe, I just set some butter out. So I have softened butter every single time I go to butter my pans. So I just use this nice softened butter and I just coat this pan all over. I can't say enough about how much I really enjoy using this pan. I will link it in the comments below in case you're interested, but it has a stainless steel lid that could also be used as a baking tray if you want. I've made things, put this in the fridge overnight. It's nice and handy to take to grandma and grandpa's house or anytime that we have a get together. It snaps on nicely. The whole thing can be baked. If I need to cover something while it's baking, I can use this lid. It's just wonderful. So then I'm going to go ahead and put that softened butter on my little mini roller here. This thing comes in handy anytime you are wanting to roll out rather than getting that larger rolling pin, I find that this one works a lot better. I also love this rolling pin for making tortillas. If you struggle rolling out tortillas, this thing is game changer. We're going to go ahead and put some of that softened butter on my dough scraper and my silicone mat here. That way things don't really stick. And in the process, I get it on my hands so that I can use that and it, the dough won't be sticky to my hands because this is a enriched dough and a sweeter dough, it, it can be somewhat sticky. So if you prefer to use oil, you could do that as well. Okay, so here is our beautifully aerated, doubled pumpkin cinnamon roll dough. Just getting it out of my bowl here. We're just gonna go ahead and incorporate all the dough, get it on my hands, and I'm gonna start flattening it out with my hands. And then I'm gonna try to roll this out to like a 15 by seven rectangle as best as I can. It does not have to be perfect. That's about the size I find works really well. So once I get, start getting it flattened, then I'm gonna grab my roller and just, we're just gonna roll it to that size.
And then that filling we made earlier, we're gonna just, we're just gonna kind of dollop that evenly along the dough. That way we can spread it out and it'll be a nice even layer. I have my little mini spatulas, which are super handy to have. And I'm just gonna spread this out the best that I can. I want it to be fairly even, but I'm leaving just a little bit of space all around the edge, maybe about a half an inch or so. Don't wanna waste any of this delicious filling. Okay, and then starting from the, I guess the shorter end, I'm gonna go ahead and roll this up. If you start from the shorter end, it gives you more swirls because you're rolling more dough up. If you go the other way, you'll have a long skinny um, log of dough and it won't be as many little pretty swirls. This makes about 12 cinnamon rolls. And once I divided it up, they, the dough pieces before they were risen were probably about an inch, give or take. So there's my nice pretty log of dough. Just wanna kinda make sure all the air bubbles are out, make sure the ends are pretty even, and then we're gonna divide this evenly into those 12 pieces I was talking about. I really like just kinda <laughs> playing with the dough. This mat is nice because I have little hash marks and measurements that I can measure out and figure up how wide I want my pieces of dough to go. So it gives me just a baseline for that. Super helpful. So I'm just gonna start by cutting it in half, cutting those in halves and half again. So we have four pieces and then here comes the math. You take the four, divide each fourth into a third. Four times three is 12. So we have 12 cinnamon rolls. The two end pieces are always slightly wonky, but I've never had a complaint once somebody goes to eat it. So you can see these beautiful swirls as we cut them through. There are other ways that you can do cinnamon rolls. If, if you prefer to cut it in the one inch strips first and then roll them up individually, you can do it that way as well. I've seen people have success with that. If they start to come unrolled like this one did a little bit, just go ahead and stick it back together. Um, if you have any of them that have like a gap or a big air piece, I just unroll it a little bit and re-roll it if there's any issues. So when I cut them, they do flatten just a tiny bit, but I find that I can just kind of finagle them to be nice little circles again pretty easily with my hands. And then here's that little last wonky one. Still has plenty of filling, still pretty delicious. I went ahead and put that on in there as well. Okay, and then I just give these all just a little bit of a smash on the top to make sure that they're all even and all the tops are pretty much aligned so that the way they bake evenly, you can see here they're nice and beautiful. We're gonna go ahead and put this lid on. See, the, the lid I was talking about was so great because I can use it for baking and proofing. <laughs> And we're going to let these rise for about 40 minutes or so. You want them to look nice and puffy and about doubled. So here they are after their rise and they're ready to bake. You're going to want to make sure to preheat the oven to 350 degrees. These probably will take somewhere between 25 and 30 minutes. Everybody's oven's a little bit different. So I like to just kind of set mine to 20 minutes and check on them. 
So while those are baking, you can make the optional icing. And this optional icing is just basically a cup of powdered sugar, one to two tablespoons of milk, and a little bit of vanilla, and mix that around until you get a nice drizzled texture or consistency. If you need a little thinner, add a little more milk. If you need a little thicker, you can always add a little bit more powdered sugar. I'm gonna give that a mix. You get that drizzle texture and then it's ready to go. I like to let these cool just a little bit before drizzling on, but I drizzle it on when it's still just a little warm. It kind of like melts in. So here they are all nice and baked. You can see they've gotten nice and big and delicious. We're gonna go ahead and just drizzle on that icing. These were so soft and fluffy and just so delicious. My house smelled amazing and everyone kept asking, when are these gonna be ready to eat? When are these gonna be ready to eat? Thanks so much for hanging out with me today while we made these pumpkin cinnamon rolls. And let me tell you, they are delicious. Also, don't forget, Make sure you're signed up so that you find out when the release date of my new cookbook is going to be. So I'm really excited about that. I wanna thank you for all your support, especially those of you who've been with me from the very beginning. If you're new around here, I really appreciate your support as well. So thank you for stopping by Grains of Small Places. Goodbye. Bye.